Hello everyone, and welcome back to John and Mandy Go RVing. Hello everyone, thanks for joining us today. We're about to head out here for southern New England. We're going to be stopping overnight at Holy Ghost Distillery up in the Poconos. And then the next day we should be in Mystic, Connecticut. Day two of our travels, we're getting ready to leave Holy Ghost Distillery here and head for Mystic, Connecticut. There's a KOA we're going to stay at there for at least five nights. So here we go. Sounds like Luca's using the scratching post. In this extended episode, we take you with us as we explore southern New England. We'll visit Mystic, Connecticut and get a slice of movie magic pizza. Next, we'll visit beautiful Arcadia State Park and take you to see the first night of fire water in Providence, Rhode Island. We'll also visit Plymouth, the site of the first Pilgrim settlement in America. We'll bike around Cape Cod on the Shining Sea Bikeway and take a ferry over to explore Martha's Vineyard. At the end, we'll visit Boston, walk the Freedom Trail, and enjoy a beer at the bar where everybody knows your name. So grab your popcorn and a drink and stay tuned. Oh! 
Without further ado, our adventures take us to the historic village of Mystic, which is situated on the southern coast of Connecticut. Mystic was a significant seaport for over 135 years. More than 600 ships were built here, starting as far back as 1784. Today, Mystic has one of the largest maritime museums in the United States, with a number of preserved sailing ships available to explore, including the whaling ship known as the Charles W. Morgan, which is the world's oldest surviving wooden whaling ship from the 19th century. So come join us as we visit the Mystic Seaport Museum and other destinations in this quaint little village. So now we're going over to check out the Mystic Seaport Museum. It's uh, outside and inside. I would say it's probably the top attraction here when you come to visit Mystic. The Mystic Seaport and Museum was established in 1929. This is the Thompson Exhibition Building at the north entrance. It contains one of seven formal galleries on this 19-acre property, which also includes a 19th century coastal village, museums, and research centers. This is the Aloha Meeting House. It was built in 1851 and served as the Baptist Church in Greenmanville. It was moved here sometime around 1955. Now we're going to check out the Sailor Made Folk Art of the Sea. Let's see what they have in here. Much better than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking old buildings and all that too, but there are only a couple of buildings in and I'm already impressed. How about you? Yeah, I'm enjoying this. But you wouldn't think of sailors as artists, you know? And that's what this is showing. That they yeah. really had some, you know, their skills on the ship really translated into some some, some neat artwork. Cool artwork, yeah. I mean, just these canes alone. Uh-huh. Little tiny hands. All this that they did here. There's Zachary Taylor. We all remember remember Zachary Taylor and his fort down in Key West, right? There he is again. <laughs> Let's check out the Voyaging in the Wake of the Whalers exhibit. Pretty interesting artifacts and works of art in here. Scrimshaw, the whaler's art. We just got done looking at some scrimshaw in the last building we were in. Some more scrimshaw.
Before you is a replica of the iconic Amistad, which was built in the Mystic Seaport Museum shipyard and launched in 2000. here before us is the Charles W. Morgan. The Charles W. Morgan is a whaling ship that was built in 1841 and made most of its 37 voyages from the ship's home port in New Bedford, Massachusetts. This type of ship was used to harvest the blubber of whales for whale oil. The Charles W. Morgan's crew averaged 33 men per voyage with most voyages taking place in the South Atlantic and Indian Oceans surviving ice and snowstorms on many occasions. The Charles W. Morgan is the world's oldest surviving non-wrecked merchant vessel and the oldest surviving wooden whaling ship from the 19th century American merchant fleet. Since the 1940s, the Charles W. Morgan has served as a museum ship and is now an exhibit here at the Mystic Seaport Museum. The Morgan was designated a National Historic Landmark in 1966. This boat was built in 1938 and uh, it served for New York City's New York City Fireboat and it served the city from 1938 all the way to 2010. It had an enormously long lifespan per ship. And, uh, oh. And during that time, it fought three major fires, okay? One during World War II in the middle of the 40s. It was a dock fire in Brooklyn. And then it fought a, a ship collision fire underneath the Verrazano Bridge in, I believe it was in 1971. And then subsequently, it provided water to the fire trucks during 9-11. Wow. Oh, okay. Brought the ship to the, to, uh, the Battery Park, if you know where that mm -hmm. is, in Lower Manhattan. And, and, and let out uh, hoses. And that's what you see in these barrels. You see those big barrels? Yeah. Okay, we have hoses. You know? um, and so they would tie them to the fire trucks. You know? and, uh, and then we have uh, eight cannons on board, eight water cannons on board, and, uh, uh, and we can shoot approximately 20,000 gallons a minute um, over 750 feet. You know, so, I never thought know. ships were used for fires. It yeah, just never occurred to me. Yeah. That's kind of cool. And, uh, and um, so this ship would have been docked, in, in, in over its years, it, it was docked at different places in the New York Harbor, but then it acted just like a firehouse. You know, you had firemen living on board, except they'd also have engineers living on board as well. And then, and, uh, and they'd have a shift just like firemen do in a firehouse. Oh, okay. So it would work just the same way. You know, nice. And you know, and uh, so what we're going to do is let's go down, we're going to go down, I'll show you the engine room and everything, then we'll go up and look at the wheelhouse and then we'll look at the cannon and all this stuff. Okay. okay. i got some great video footage of you, we just watch her operate a cannon. Can I aim it at him? Here, this is the brass room and, uh, and this is, they have all kinds of different fittings. You know that they, they use for different uh, things, but everything operated by water. And uh, for example, this is a saw, you know, and but it operates with water. Those are jackhammers behind you. They operate the water water jackhammers and, okay. and all and uh, um, and all. And uh, and then they had things like you see that thing with multiple, you know, uh, um, you know this crazy thing. Uh, you can actually put that onto a hose and put it underneath the dock, and then it would just spray all over the place. So you could help put out a fire that was on the dock. Wow. Okay, so we're going to go down now and look at the living quarters, okay? So in 2010, when New York City stopped using this, they eventually went to a nonprofit, okay? And the nonprofit runs this ship. This is actually, and it's a national landmark, a marine landmark. and. And uh, the ship is its own museum. We're actually separate from the seaport. Uh -huh. okay. and in the past, they've been on Long Island, and they brought it here now. Okay, and uh, so that's what we're, we're we're doing. And the man in charge is right there. Gotcha. Uh -huh. The director. Okay, and, and painter and all. And the people that almost everybody else are volunteers, including me, we just volunteer our time on this. Nice. So come this way. Okay. Well, thanks for volunteering. Yeah. So this is uh, the valve where water comes in. Okay, 
All right, so they open this up and then they see water. It's sea it water pulls it right from the sea. Right up, yeah. And then, um, um, and then the vet, and then the water goes through these gigantic pipes, you know, to the different cannons. Wow. Okay. So be very careful going this way. So the, the, this, we're now in the engine room. Okay, watch out for this, this guy. This is the, the killer right here. Okay. Watch out for that. And then there's this red valve down here. Okay. okay, so. So this is actually a, an electric, a diesel electric ship. Okay, what you see here is, is two 1500 horsepower diesel engines. They're the same vintage as submarines, okay, and uh, back in World War II. And those would, would power those six generators that you see in the back, those mm -hmm. electric generators. They would generate the electricity that runs this boat. And then in the bay, way back, you see those round things back there? The big round things, those are the actual propulsion engines. Wow. Connected to the propeller, so it's an electric boat. Then up here, here, these are the electric motors for four huge pumps that wow. actually pump the water. Each one pumps at about 5,000 gallons a minute. Okay, that's how this all sort of works. Wow. It's electric, so come this way, we'll go back here. And this is a, your, your diesel engines powering these six uh, electric generators you know, on, the one, on each side. And then that powers these two gigantic electric motors. Oh my. Okay, and, this, and, they, and they're connected to the propellers. Okay, the propulsion they call it, but nonetheless. Okay, so come on up here, we'll go where the engineers sit. Okay, for staying. Okay, so this is where the engineers would be when the ship was running. Okay. okay, they'd be controlling the pressure back there, right where you are, is a pressure gauge to control. Okay, and, uh, and then here's your control panel. From the, from the wheelhouse, they would tell them, you know, that's one engine, that's the other engine, you want to go forward, back, reverse, whatever. Wow. Okay, and then that's an electric panel over there, it looks like out of a Frankenstein movie. Yeah, it does. Okay. It does. <laughs> uh, and all, and, uh, and then current, this is it all DC, DC current. We have a telephone. You can you see that telephone? You can telephone up to the to the wheelhouse, you know, that way and communicate with them. But when the when the motors are on and the, and the ship is you know pumping water, it's extremely noisy in here. I love uh, that. You know, and uh, you can always smell the ripe smell of diesel fuel. We have like nine thousand gallons of diesel fuel on board, and so wow. You know, when the ship is going, you can smell it. You know. So this is the uh, wheelhouse. And um, what you see is, you know, obviously we have our wheel, and uh, and uh, and then here's how the, the captain would be communicating. You know, remember you saw the phone downstairs? Uh -huh. Yeah. So you have the phone here, and then and then this is how they would communicate to, you know, to engineers forward, reverse, or whatever they want to go, and uh, and all. And so uh, almost everything in here is vintage, but we do have more modern equipment. You know, to to sail. This is this boat actually operates. Does it? Do you take it out ever? So it's going to Boston the first week of June. Oh, okay. What's it doing there? It was there's a, a fire safety convention. Oh. Okay. So it's going to go there. And uh, and then this is one of our cannons here that's being polished. Okay. It's like a never-ending job. Yeah, I was going to say that's all you guys are doing. So how many? So, how many man crew does it take to run this then? Well, you know, it, it really is depends on what's going on in the engine room. You know what I mean? And uh, you really only need like one person up here. But uh, so I think right now they're talking 10. Okay. Six to 10 people operating this, you know? And, uh, and as I said, it's all a function of what goes on downstairs. You need a, a captain. I think the Coast Guard requires, I think the Coast Guard requires a captain, a paid captain, and a paid first mate. Oh. Okay, and then no one else has to be. And then, and then, in, on this ship, we have to find volunteers that, that have engine experience, and are also licensed. You know, oh, okay. so it's not an easy no, thing to I do. So, that. So, yeah. Still using the same old guys, many of which were worked on this ship at one time in the past. You wow. Know? And um, and also. It's not an easy thing to operate. At least they're familiar with the ship then, if they worked yeah, on yeah. it in the past. Yeah. So, yeah. so come on out and we'll look at one of these cannons so you get sort of a better look you know? Okay. You know, so come this way. So this is the on-off valve, okay? And then these are used to, to make it turn, you know? So why don't you help me out? Can you help me? I can that? try. Okay, so you <laughs> turn this. I want to straighten this, this cannon out. So first, go to the back, okay? And right there and, and turn that. Okay. Which one? I don't know. Just 
Put some muscle yeah, in it. Yeah, it's pretty hard, huh? Okay. It's very right. hard. Now go to the back. Okay. Turn the other wheel. So we're going to raise the cannon up. Okay. That's it. That's okay. it. Keep going. Keep going. All right. That's great. For children, the museum offers many opportunities for hands on instruction, art classes, a children's museum and a few outside play areas. The Tawarki Planetarium features daily shows. Check at the entrance for details. This planetarium, it's an extra $8 a person if you want to watch the half hour show. Just a heads up. At the beginning of the village in the north side, you'll find a tavern called Schaefer's Spouter. The recreated fishing village is like a step back in time. It has demonstrations and guides all year round. In order to print something, you first have to make it. So let's say, for example, that you wanted to hire people to go on a whaling voyage, okay. and you wanted this made. You'd have to write this manually by hand, and you'd have to tell us what font you wanted, what size you wanted, and then we would take it, and we would start to make it. And in order to do that, we would have to pull these. Well, these are called out. sorts. So every letter, every number, every space, even the punctuation, they're all sorts, and they live in cases like this one. And you pull them out one at a time, and you build line by line what your print job is going to be. So for each <coughs> line that's here, it's all made up of individual letters and spaces. I don't oh, think there wow. are any numbers in here. Maybe wow. down here there's a number. Now, backwards is really challenging. Yeah. Okay? We know what word that is, right? Mm -hmm. What word is that? Rules. Rules, right? How do you spell rules? R-U-L-E-S. Right. Mm -hmm. Now spell it backwards. S-E-L-U-R <laughs> is really difficult. S-E-L-U-R. It doesn't mean anything to us. Yeah. Your brain can't translate it. Yeah. So instead of trying to do each line backwards, we do it upside down. If I do it upside down, I can start with the first letter. Um, R-U-L-E-S. Oh yes, rules. Even okay. upside down, my brain can translate that. Right. And then if I flip it over, it's, backwards. it's right side up and backwards. Right side. Hmm. So that's how we do each line, upside down and then backwards. And we do that line by line. Something like this took an experienced typesetter, someone who's been doing this for at least two years, mm -hmm. 45 minutes. Yeah, easily. Okay. But it came from eight different cases. Because each time you see a change in the font, that comes from a different case. So there's about eight cases worth in this one job. Oh, so it's see. not just enough to pull it. It's Fine. knowing it's which case am I going to next. And then if you had two jobs going on at the same time, you'd be able to use the same case. You could. You could. You could. But then you're more likely to run into a really awful problem. You reach into your case to get an E, no and there aren't any more. Yeah. You're out of sorts. Yeah. And that gets you pretty upset. Because no you weren't paid sorts. by the hour. You are paid based on what you got done. Yeah. Uh, and if you're out of sorts, you have to stop what you're doing. You have to take a whole box of font and load the entire case. I can't reach in and grab one E. Right. I have to load the entire one. And since I'm paid only for what I'm doing here, I'm not getting paid to do that. Okay. So that makes me a little upset. So okay. whether it was then or now, out of sorts is not good. <laughs> <laughs> That's where that term came from, out of sorts. Out of sorts. You're yeah, out, of sorts. out of sorts. Printers were very proud of their work and they let everybody know it. And that's why there are quite a few phrases that you're very familiar with, but uh -huh. I didn't realize they came from a print shop. Oh, wow. So I'm going to make an impression. Oh. This is a blank piece of paper. We can all agree on that, right? right? Mm -hmm. Nothing up my sleeve. <laughs> I'm gonna load this paper here into my make, ready? And I'm gonna take some ink with my brayer, roll it, and then transfer that ink onto my typeset. So every single one of those letters, numbers, or spaces is all locked up here right now. Right. Now, I am going to put the paper to bed so you can say good night. Good night.
<laughs> Putting the paper to bed means I'm rolling the bed underneath the platen. It's also the symbol that we are not doing any more typesetting. So whether it's right or wrong, it's getting printed. Wow. Now, as I pull on the tail, the platen is going to push down, it's going to squish, and it's going to deliver between 800 and 1,000 pounds of pressure. Wow. <laughs> and then, my friends, we get our finished impression. Hey, look at that. <laughs> nice. Now, if you look at the back, you understand why we call them impressions. Uh, yeah. Because the typeset yeah. is going to press into the paper. Mm -hmm. That's how you can tell that something was hand set and printed on a letterpress. Uh -huh. And in the end, the printer only wants to make a good impression. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here till Thursday, try the meal. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how you do it, that's one so cool. at a time. Wow. You can't make multiples with this. Yeah. My best is around 25 to 30 seconds to make a single, which is not bad. Okay. They all have to be made one at a time. So if someone so, wanted a hundred of these printed up, it's you're doing it a hundred times. Yeah. Absolutely. So out of sorts, right? Mm -hmm. Putting the paper to bed. We yeah. know these expressions, yeah. but we may not have known they came from the print shop. Wow. Hmm. So let's talk about another one that came from the print shop. When you're locking this up, uh -huh. okay, there is no bottom to this. Wow. Okay. It's just a friction fit that's being held with these wedges. Oh, okay. okay. These wedges are called coins, not spelled the way that your pocket changes. It's coin with a Q. It comes from the French word for wedge. Mm. They look like this. So when you're locking it up, essentially you are coining your phrase. Ah. <laughs> That's where That's that cool. comes from. That's so cool. Yeah, cool. So the California job case, which is this one right here, uh -huh. This was used into the 20th century. It was the last version of the case that was made. Um, this kind of printing, movable type, was right. in use till about 1985. The Washington Post was the last newspaper to continue having some of it set by hand. Wow. It was a union job. Okay. So they kept that going. Keep going. The new stuff, the pertinent stuff, that was all being used with linotype at the time. And then when computers came, it was all gone. It was all computer. Yeah. So that's how the case was towards the end. But wow. earlier than that, it wasn't as convenient as this. I mean, here we've got all our capital letters here. Everything else is right here. One case. They had two cases like this. So one of our more famous founding fathers used to work in a print shop. Same guy that liked to fly kites at lightning storms. Yeah. <laughs> so Ben Franklin would operate a case system like this. Everything he used most often was kept right in front of him. So all the little letters, the numbers, the spaces, all the punctuation right here. Capital letters are not used quite so often. They were kept here. Right? When would you print anything in all capitals? I know what you're thinking. Someone. You wanted to send someone an angry text. Yes. <laughs> Franklin wasn't that kind of guy. Yeah, so your capital letters were kept in the uppercase and your little letters were kept in the lowercase. That's why we call them uppercase letters and lowercase letters. There's a very old fire engine. Very old. Check out that tricycle. They don't make them like they used to. And how would you even get up on that two wheel bike? There's a, there's a spokes, on the side. Yeah. Okay. The Mystic Seaport Lighthouse was constructed in 1966 but has never been used as a navigational aid. Inside are a few seats and features two short films about the history of lighthouses in the United States. The Henry B. DuPont Preservation Shipyard is a working shipyard that repairs, restores, and builds all sorts of watercraft. It was a great afternoon at the museum. Now, let's jump in the car and check out downtown Mystic.
I don't know about you, but I'm feeling a little hungry right now. Let's see what we can find to eat. Mystic Pizza has been serving slices since 1973 and became the setting of that iconic 1988 movie, Mystic Pizza. We just had to go in and have a slice. So we're here at Mystic Pizza and we got a pizza. Pizza. How is it? Good. Tastes good? Mm hmm. Kind of like Pizza Hut. <laughs> Next door, we found a brewery set in an old bank building called Bank and Bridge. It is a laid-back bar that is family-friendly, including the canines. Dogs are welcome on the outside seating area. What did you get, huh? PB and J Porter. You got a PB and J Porter? Yeah. Yeah. And I got a plate here with Lucas, Mystic, Joker, and Nana. We are ending our day in Mystic at Sift a highly recommended bakery that features specialty coffees, artisan breads, and desserts. Four-way brownies. So we just got back from Mystic. So we can't wait to eat our desserts. We sample them. They are pretty. Can you get that side? Yep. All right. So this is John's blue violet cheesecake. Blueberry violet. Blueberry cheesecake. violet cheesecake. And this is my chocolate milk chocolate hazelnut. I think it's a cake. Yeah. So it's very pretty. Almost too pretty to eat. So we're gonna almost too pretty. Give them a taste <laughs> test here. I'll let you go first. Ooh. Mmm. John's never had cheesecake before, right? I've had it before, but only like once. And this is pretty good. Oh, it's not a cake. It's be a mousse of some sort. <laughs> I already made a mess of it. Mm. Good? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to sample mine now? Yeah, you want to take a little bit of mine? Yeah. I'm not a huge cheesecake fan. Pretty good. All right, let's try yours. Not bad. Do you like hazelnut? Some people don't like hazelnut. I'm not a fan of hazelnut, but it's doing good here. Hitting a spot. So this was from Sift in Mystic. Yes. Yeah, definitely stop by Sip there in Mystic. You will be satisfied with whatever you get there. I'm pretty sure. I have a croissant from the morning for breakfast. Yeah. And I have this for breakfast oh, too, so I don't finish it tonight. There's something real crunchy in the middle there. <laughs> Give us one more bite at least. Yeah, I don't think I could eat this all in one sitting. New box kitty. Look adorable in there, kitty. You hanging out? They just learned the box. 
You learn how to box? I thought I was the one with the bad dad jokes. What do you think, Mitch T? Yeah, I'm, I'm, my mom did it, yeah. So I'm sure many of you wonder how we're able to travel as often as we do. One tool we like to use when looking for campgrounds is Thousand Trails. It's a campground membership with plans to meet your camping needs. The Thousand Trails system offers a variety of RV sites, tent sites, and cabins, plus many offer a ton of amenities and activities. Many are located near popular vacation destinations. We found that the campground serve as a perfect home base when we're exploring new areas. Thousand Trails can work for the weekend campers, full-time RVers, and every type of camper in between. The membership specialists will work with you personally to fit the membership to your camping needs and budget. Contact Michael and Lori, membership specialists who are ready to answer your questions. And please don't forget to mention John and Mandy Go RVing when you call. The Arcadia Management Area covers over 14,000 acres of mostly wooded lands, with the Wood River flowing through the heart of this beautiful state park. There is a variety of opportunities to enjoy the outdoors here at Arcadia, including hiking, mountain biking, horseback riding, hunting, fishing, boating, and having a nice afternoon picnic. There are two locations recommended to mountain bikers for parking. The Brook Trail parking lot, or here at the Browning Mill Pond Recreation Area. There are over a dozen trails in Arcadia, including over 40 miles of single track trails with various difficulty levels. Kayakers and canoeists can enjoy the Wood Rivers Class 1 and Class 2 rapids as they make their way through the forest. There are many access points at major road crossings, including this designated canoe launch area with plenty of visitor parking. Let's check out one of Rhode Island's few waterfalls. Stepstone Falls is a series of small waterfalls with a combined drop of roughly 10 feet. The waterfall can be found on the Ben Utter Trail.
was getting in his afternoon nap a little early today. He likes his belly rubs. We are boondocking at Ocean State Harley-Davidson, which is a Harvest Host location in Nexter, Rhode Island. Then we go for an e-bike ride on the East Bay bike path, enjoying the afternoon weather. We conclude the day with a visit to downtown Providence to join the celebration as the city kicks off its 2022 water fire season in Water Place Park, so stay tuned. For us, Ocean State Harley-Davidson has two locations to serve the public. The main store is located in Warwick, and the secondary store can be found here in Exeter, Rhode Island. The great thing about the Harley-Davidson Exeter store is that it welcomes Harvest Host members. We had a pleasant experience as the owners and staff were very friendly, which made us feel welcomed. We highly recommend an overnight stay at this Harvest Host location on your way through to your next destination. Very nice, a 1930 Harley. Yeah, it's an old steam engine from one of the West Warwick uh, mills. There used to be three of them. The other two, unfortunately, were smashed apart. Wow. And this one is the last one to me. It used to drive a water pump. And it's about half put back together. The governor and everything is over there. Okay. And all the dog gear for it. We even have the tags for it somewhere. This is an old, uh, this is what they call a lubricator. So this is where you see the oil dripping on all the, you know, okay. the different parts of the engine. So that's going on. And somewhere here, these are the weights for the governor. Oh, here it is. So we even have the original tag for it. Wow. It's <laughs> pretty neat. So we're here in Providence, Rhode Island, and we figured we'd get out on our e-bikes today and try out the East Bay bike path that they have here. Wow. It's such a beautiful day for a ride on the e-bikes. This is pretty cool. I really like how the water surrounds both sides on this section of the trail.
Well, I think it's time to speed things up a bit so we can make it over to downtown Providence for the water fire event this evening. Providence, Rhode Island is one of the oldest cities in the United States. The surrounding area was founded in 1636 by Roger Williams, who was a Reformed Baptist and a religious exile from the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Williams was a minister who advocated for the separation of church and state, and he condemned colonists' confiscation of land from Native Americans. As a result for these beliefs, Roger Williams was convicted of sedation and heresy and banished from the colony, which eventually led Williams and his followers to settle in this area. Over the last couple centuries, Providence was a large part of the manufacturing industry, producing industrial products like precision tools, textiles, silverware, and steam engines. Today, Providence covers over 20 square miles and has become the third most populous city in New England. Providence, Rhode Island, you have a beautiful capital. Comprised of 327,000 cubic feet of white Georgia marble, the Rhode Island State House took 10 years to build and was completed in 1901. Providence, Rhode Island, you have a beautiful city here. Yeah, we just got here. It really is gorgeous. Yes, very much so. And we're going to go explore some more of it. Yep, we're going to go check out the water fire event. So that should be fun. But first and foremost, dinner. Dinner. So we chose the cheesecake factory. I got a skinny luscious chicken pasta. What did you get? I don't know, some kind of breaded chicken and lemon sauce, I forget the name of it, but it's very good. Yes, it's very good food here. You might not know this, but water fire is a sculpture. That's right, it was created by a man named Barnaby Evans in 1994 to celebrate the 10th anniversary of First Night Providence. This has like a spiritual, ceremonial ambience to it. This experience has a sense of serenity to me 
and that I can feel the energy radiating from everything around me. Or possibly I got a contact buzz. Oh well. I'm really enjoying this, and I'm pretty sure that Mandy is as well. Festivals and events like this are great, as they bring the community together. Toss your differences aside and just come out to enjoy the great food and festivities, the fresh air, and most of all, time with your friends, and time with your loved ones. Pilgrim Memorial State Park was created in 1920 to celebrate the 300th anniversary of the Pilgrim Landing. Here you will find the National Monument to the Forefathers as well as Plymouth Rock. There is also a full-scale replica of the original Mayflower docked in the bay for visitors to tour. The Mayflower departed from Plymouth, England on June 16, 1620 with 102 passengers and a crew of about 30 to 40 men. The Mayflower spent over two months traveling across the Atlantic Ocean, 
constantly being battered by westerly gales. They finally made landfall on the northern tip of Cape Cod, now known as Providence Town Harbor on November 19, 1620. This monument was dedicated to William Bradford, who was one of the 102 passengers on the Mayflower's voyage to America. He went on to serve as governor of the Plymouth Colony from 1621 to 1657. Here we have Plymouth Rock. It is said that the Pilgrims first set foot in America at the site of Plymouth Rock, although there is no historical evidence to prove it. This statue of Massasoit, the leader of the Native American tribe of Wampanoags, was completed in 1921. He made a peace treaty with the Pilgrims in 1620, which was honored until his death. Right in front of the Memorial State Park here, they have all of these restaurants and shops you can hit to. Now we're at the National Monument to the Four Fathers. This is part of Pilgrim Memorial State Park. The monument is 81 feet high and was erected in 1889 to commemorate the Pilgrims. It features the virtues of faith, morality, education, law, and liberty. This is the oldest continuously operated museum in the country. The Pilgrim Hall Museum tells the story of the Pilgrim's voyage to America and the Plymouth Colony. Here's an old armory that was turned into a residence. So we're going to try out this place called Martini's Bar and Grill. They have jazz tonight, so maybe we'll catch some of that too. We are out for an afternoon bike ride in Cape Cod, exploring the Shining Sea Bikeway, which is a rail trail located in Falmouth, Massachusetts. So we're here in Falmouth, Massachusetts, and we're going to try out the Shining Sea Bikeway. You ready to do this? Yeah, let's go. The Shining Sea Bikeway is currently 10.7 miles long. The trail starts in North Falmouth and runs south all the way to the Steamship Authority Ferry Terminal, located in Woods Hole. The name of the trail is a reference to the patriotic song, America the Beautiful. Catherine Lee Bates, who is the author of the song's lyrics, was born in Falmouth. You can find a plaque commemorating her poem near mile marker two. I 
see the beach. We'll come back. Let's go get a shot of the beach. Shining Sea Bikeway. We had to take a little detour there for a few minutes to check out the ocean. Now we'll get back on track here and continue on down the Shining Sea Bikeway. So far, so good. We're enjoying this. We like that it's paved, so it makes for a nice smooth ride. This is a beautiful path that meanders through green spaces, downtown Falmouth, and is the only bike path in Cape Cod that runs along the seashore. Woods Hole is a popular place for people to catch the ferry over to Martha's Vineyard.
The ferry runs several times a day and takes about 45 minutes to reach the island. Woods Hole is a quaint section of Falmouth where you'll find plenty of shops and restaurants with a beautiful waterfront. This small place is also big on marine science. It is home to the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, the Marine Biological Laboratory, and the Woods Hole Science Aquarium, as well as several marine education centers. and really love the atmosphere in this seaside restaurant. getting ready to catch the ferry here of what's whole over to Martha's Vineyard. As you can tell it's a little windy, a little cold, a little rainy, uh, but you can't control the weather so we're just gonna go and try to have a good day. If you need a bite to eat or a coffee, there's a snack bar on board. Here we go. Since it's too cold for the electric bike and we didn't want to pay the fee to bring the car over on the ferry, we plan to use the public bus to get around Martha's Vineyard. An all-day pass is only $8 and there are regular pickups at the most popular towns. Public transportation is a great way to cut down costs and saves you from having to find those parking spots in popular tourist destinations. We highly recommend seeking out buses, trams, and trolleys as fun and inexpensive ways to get around. Vineyard Haven is a working harbor village in the town of Tisbury. Year-round, it serves as a destination port for Martha's Vineyard, as well as a cultural and tourist hotspot. Vineyard Haven was established in 1871 as a fishing village. Today, it is a charming, walkable town, full of small gift shops, tasty restaurants, and beaches. 
It is also one of the main entry ports to Martha's Vineyard. Once you get off the ferry here, there's a little map of Martha's Vineyard. You can get an idea of where you want to go. If you haven't already. What are we trying to do? So we want to go from here, here Vineyard Haven, down to Aquina. That's where the Gay Head Lighthouse and Cliffs are. <laughs> Aquina is a town located on the western end of Martha's Vineyard, which is known for its beautiful clay cliffs, as well as its Native American historical importance. Aquina has a small shopping district and a beautiful observation deck for a view of the cliffs and Gay Head Light. We are here before tourist season has officially begun, so not all of the shops are open. There are only three restaurants easily accessible from the lighthouse. The Aquina Shop Restaurant is the closest to the Cliffs Overlook area. Here stands Gay Headlight, which was the first lighthouse constructed on Martha's Vineyard. It helps sailors avoid a dangerous section of underwater rocks near the cliffs known as Devil's Bridge. When first constructed in 1799, it was a 47-foot wooden tower on a stone base. After years of constant assault from the harsh New England elements, the lighthouse was moved 75 feet back from the eroding cliffs in 1844, and a 51-foot brick tower took its place in 1856. In 2015, the lighthouse was moved once again, this time 180 feet back from the eroding cliffs where it stands today. Gay Head Lighthouse was placed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1987. Here we have the Aquina Wapanoag Native American Museum, which opened to the public in 2006. It's a great place to explore the Wapanoag culture from multiple viewpoints. Let's follow this trail as it winds its way down to the beach. Another popular point of entry into Martha's Vineyard is Oak Bluffs. This is Ocean Park, a seven-acre green space where several festivals occur each year. One of the most popular is Martha's Vineyard's Wind Festival, which centers around kite making and flying. It takes place in September. A walk along Oak Bluffs Center Square reveals a mixture of beautiful homes with elements of Victorian, cottage, gingerbread, and art deco architecture.
Oak Bluffs is a beautiful small town comprising of only seven miles of land. Oak Bluffs is the only town in Martha's Vineyard that was designed around tourism. Tourists can grab a bite to eat, shop for souvenirs, or simply walk the town. So we decided to eat here at Sharky's in Oak Bluffs, and she got a pulled pork sandwich, and I got sizzling fajitas. So we're ready to dig in. We're going to grab a beer at Martha's Vineyard's Chatter Company before we head back over to Vineyard Haven to catch the ferry back home. Got a local beer here. It's the Miami Washer Shore Beer Company. They're originally from Martha's Vineyard. Oak Bluffs Marina is the largest on Martha's Vineyard and connects via ferry to Falmouth and Hyannis. You will also find more shops and restaurants down by the water at the marina. Well, I think this concludes our visit to Martha's Vineyard, but stick around. Tomorrow, we visit Boston. Today we are here in Boston, Massachusetts, ready to explore the birthplace of American independence. Mandy and I have our walking shoes on, and we are ready to step back in time as we learn our country's early history on the Freedom Trail. Boston was founded in 1630 by Puritan settlers from the English town of the same name. Several key events of the American Revolution took place here in Boston, such as the Boston Massacre, the Boston Tea Party, the Battle of Bunker Hill, and the Siege of Boston. After America won its independence, Boston spent many years as an important port and manufacturing hub, as well as a center for education and culture. Today, Boston is the capital and most populous city of Massachusetts, with a population of nearly 700,000, also making Boston the most populous city in all of New England. The Freedom Trail begins in Boston Common, which is a 44-acre city park located in the middle of the city. The park was a pasture at one time, owned by William Blackstone, who was Boston's first white settler. The Boston Commons Visitor Center is located in this building at the beginning of the Freedom Trail. 
Here you can get a map, souvenirs, and information from their knowledgeable staff. So after you get here at the visitor center, there's this uh, line that you can follow for the Freedom Trail. You just follow this line of bricks and it'll take you through the whole trail. The visitor center also offers walking tours the city with guides. These range in price from $25 to $55. In 1634, the people of Boston purchased William Blackstone's pasture, and in return he received 50 acres of his own land. For years the common was used as a training field for the militia, and as a place for the cattle to graze. The common is now a place for public celebration and demonstration, a place to escape the hectic life of the city, to stretch out for a bit and take in nature, maybe enjoy a picnic or a game of tennis. Governor Samuel Adams and Paul Revere presided over the laying of the first cornerstone here at what is known as the New Massachusetts State House in 1795. This magnificent architecture was designed by Charles Bullfinch, a Boston local who designed the state capitals for Massachusetts and Maine. Charles also worked on the U.S. Capitol in Washington, D.C. The Park Street Church was built in 1809 on the site of the Old Town Granary. This church boasts many firsts, including America's first Sunday school in 1817, the first prison aid society in 1824, and sent the first missionaries to Hawaii in 1819. This is also the site where the hymn America, also known as My Country Tis of Thee, was sung for the first time in 1831 on the steps of the church. The Granary Burial Ground is the city's third oldest graveyard, first used in 1660. Its name derives from the old grain warehouse that once stood next door on the site of the Park Street Church. A variety of famous people are buried here, including Benjamin Franklin's parents, Governor Samuel Adams, the five victims of the Boston Massacre, John Hancock, and Paul Revere. King's Chapel was founded in 1686 and was the first church to have a pipe organ in New England. It is also the church with the oldest pulpit with continuous use in the U.S., dating back to 1717. Boston Latin School was the first public school in America, founded in 1635. A statue of its most famous student, Benjamin Franklin, is near the marker of the site of the school. Here we have Boston's Old City Hall, which was erected in 1864. Its structure is comprised of a fashionable French Second Empire style. It currently houses private offices and a restaurant. The old South Meeting House was erected in 1729 
and served the Puritan congregation of Boston. This building is central to our independence. Discussions around taxation, freedom of speech, and details of the Boston Tea Party occurred here. State House, built in 1713, was once the most imposing structure in Boston. This was the capital of the colony and the center of the British authority. After the Revolutionary War, the state government left the old State House when the new one on Beacon Hill was completed in 1798. Faneuil Hall and Marketplace began in 1742 as a marketplace and meeting hall. Today, it takes up over 300,000 square feet in downtown Boston. It contains retailers, vendors, shops, and offices. Quincy Market Food Colonnade has over 30 food merchants with cuisine from around the corner and around the globe. We're having lunch at Ned Devine's, an Irish pub and restaurant with outdoor seating in the heart of the marketplace. So we're going to start off here with some pretzels for appetizer. So these pretzels come with this jalapeno sauce. Yummy. So Mandy got a grilled Greek salad. I got a ham, egg, and cheese croissant sandwich with hot browns next to it. Yeah, we were lucky enough to hit uh, brunch, so we'll get a little cheaper and it looks good. The North End was Boston's first neighborhood, established in the 1630s. It operated as a home for tradesmen and mechanics, before turning into a rather rough neighborhood after the Revolutionary War. The 1800s, however, was a turn for the better, when over 50,000 Irish immigrants settled here, and, after a while, Italian immigrants moved in. Influences of each era can be seen today in the shops, bars and restaurants that line the streets.
we are just loving all the architecture throughout this city. The old and the new. It's just breathtaking. Here we have the Bell in Hand Tavern, which is the oldest bar in America. Established in 1795, it is believed to be the oldest continuously operating bar in the United States. Although the bar stopped operating during the Prohibition years, the bar has moved several times and is currently found on Union Street. This small wooden house is Boston's oldest structure, built in 1676, then rebuilt four years later after a devastating fire. Its fame came nearly a hundred years later when Paul Revere owned the house. Paul Revere was a silversmith that is most known for his patriotism on the night of April 18, 1775, which we will talk about once we reach the Old North Church. The Old North Church is Boston's oldest standing church, built in 1723. Here on the night of April 18, 1775, Paul Revere's lanterns in the steeple were lit to signal how the British Army would march. Light one lantern if by land, two if by sea. Two lanterns were lit, sending Paul Revere and other messengers on horseback to alert others of the British advancement. Copps Hill Burial Ground contains the remains of Cotton Mather, the preacher who penned a book that would help perpetuate ideas that led to the Salem Witch Trials. TD Garden Arena is the home of the Boston Celtics and the Boston Bruins. It opened in 1995 as a replacement for the original Boston Garden. This is City Square Park. City Square Park has been serving the residents of Boston's Charlestown neighborhood since the 1800s. It spans approximately an acre. Boston is such a beautiful city. I never thought it was this beautiful here. We are now making our way over to the Bunker Hill Monument. The Bunker Hill Monument cornerstone was laid on the 50th anniversary of the Battle of Bunker Hill on June 17, 1825. Due to a lack of funds, it took 17 and a half years to complete the project. The 221-foot granite obelisk was one of the earliest examples of the Egyptian Revival-style architecture. the USS Constitution Museum and Store. The museum's mission is to educate visitors about old Ironsides and to elicit excitement about its heritage.
The USS Constitution is the most celebrated ship in American history. It was built here in the Charlestown Navy Yard and launched on October 21st, 1797. The Constitution has survived many battles due to its hull, which is built partially of live oak, which is estimated to be five times more durable than white oak. On many occasions, cannonballs would just bounce off the ship's sides, earning its nickname, Old Ironsides. The ship has been restored several times over the years and is open to the public year-round. The USS Case and Young is a Fletcher-class destroyer that was launched and commissioned in 1943. Although built in San Pedro, California, 14 other ships just like her were produced here between 1943 and 1944. The vessel was named after Captain Case and Young, who served with honor at Pearl Harbor and died at Guadalcanal. The U.S. Case and saw heavy action during World War II in Iwo Jima and Okinawa. The Cheers Bar, formerly known as the Bull and Finch, was established on Beacon Hill in 1969. In the early 1980s, two TV writers visited the Bull and Finch and found their inspiration for the beloved TV series. There's a large gift shop on the upper level. That was closed by the time we arrived, but there was a small one behind the bar, so I was still able to get my t-shirt. Having a beer at Cheers was a great way to celebrate our day in Boston. So what did you think of Boston today, Mandy? I love Boston. I think it's a great city. We had a really good time today, didn't we? Yes, we did, and I think it's my new favorite city. I was really entertained by what I, everything I saw today. It's an interesting city. There's a lot of green spaces, and then there's all these old buildings and old old streets, and then there's these huge, beautiful skyscrapers. It's like everything. Yeah, you get a little bit of everything here. And the people are so nice here. Thanks everyone for joining us today, and if you found any of this information useful, please give us a like and feel free to subscribe. Take care everyone.